goodness. Can we just give Catherine another, another round of applause? She is incredible. Oh, guys, how are we doing? How's everybody doing? Verbal, yeah, yeah? I know we're so close to lunch. And I know like in school, like when you're so close to lunch and you're like, oh, I'm dying. Like you were almost there. So if you can hang in with us just for a little bit longer. I know God has been speaking to you guys and I just don't want you to miss a thing. So I'm glad that you're having a great time. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, and I'm just going to dive in because I only have about 20-ish minutes. And yeah, I don't want to waste any time. So if you can, guys can pray with me really quick. God, I just thank you for every single girl that you have in this room. God, I thank you that you see them, you know them, you know their hearts, their stories, their struggles. Um, Lord, I just thank you that you have them here for a reason, that it's not by accident. Um, God, and I just pray that your spirit would just take, sorry, I feel like my microphone's too close, God. I feel like your spirit would just take total reign and total control in this room. You would continue to move in hearts in the way that only you can, God. And I pray that I would just be a vessel for you, Lord, that I would not get in the way. I would just speak your truth clearly, God, in the way I should. And I just pray that you would engage these girls' hearts, God, that you would give them eyes to see and you would give them ears to hear the things that you want them to see today, the things that you want them to hear, Lord. And I just thank you that you are faithful, that the work that you began in them, Lord, that you will continue until it's complete, God. And I thank you that that's a promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so I'm diving in. So just to give you just a snapshot of kind of where my life has been the past few years. So about two and a half years ago, my husband and I moved to a tiny little town called Hogansville, Georgia. And y'all, listen, I am an actress and I was living in the heart of Los Angeles. So Hogansville, Georgia was a big change for me at the time, but God made it so specifically clear that out of all the places, oh yeah, there's me and my hubby, out of all the places that we were supposed to put roots down there and we could fly all over the place, do whatever we need to do, but Hogansville was gonna be home. And crazy enough, the past two and a half years, we have been a part of a really unique group of people that's been flipping and renovating this town. So it's been kind of like deserted and, and empty for the past few decades, and our goal has been to bring it back to life. And so it's been a crazy adventure. It's been really, really fun. But my husband is um, very hands-on in the day-to-day -day of our town flip. And y'all, he is one of those people that is good at everything. Like, I'm not kidding. He is like the designer and the hard labor. Like, yeah, he's always on rooftops. He's always building. But I tell people, I'm like, he is Chip and Joanna. Like, he's both. I'm like, what am I doing, you know? Like, he, he's just so good. But when we first got married, the world of construction was, like, so new to me. So along the way, Caleb has been, um, that's something he's designed, um, he's been uh, teaching me just all the steps to building and why they're important. And, you know, sometimes I zone out. But out of all the things, I have learned that the foundation of a house is the most important part of the entire structure. In fact, one article I found says this. The strength and stability of the structure depends upon its foundation. If the foundation fails, then the superstructure, however strong it may be, cannot stand. So it doesn't matter how incredible or beautiful, you know, we build a building. If it doesn't have a foundation or if the foundation is wrong, it's going to crumble. So hang on to that thought for just a second. It's going to be very important, all that talk, all that construction talk. We're going to come back to it. But our theme verse, if we can pivot just to a second, um, you know our theme verse. We've said it a few times already, but I'm just going to read it. It says, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. So listen, this verse is out of the book of Lamentations, the book of Lamentations in the Bible. And if you don't know what Lamentations means, it means grieving, deep sorrow, mourning. So we have all of these chapters in Lamentations of grieving, and then all of a sudden, we have this verse of hope smack in the middle of the book. 
So today I'm going to talk to three different camps of people. And as I do, in your heart, I want you to identify which camp you're in. And I want to show you, I, I don't want to show you, I want to continue um, to, to show you and to point you to how our theme verse, Lamentations 3, 21 through 24, was not just meant for the writer who penned it thousands of years ago, but it was meant for you today, no matter which camp you find yourself in. Um, so a little backstory, a little context for our theme verse. So the, so the writer in Lamentations is a prophet named Jeremiah. And at the time that God called Jeremiah to teach and to preach and to speak to God's people was extremely lonely and difficult for him because the people of God were living in so much rebellion. And they were participating in this fake and false worship like it was horrific. But... God, in his kindness, used Jeremiah um, to continually warn and remind his people to turn away from their sin and to turn back to God. If not, they would be turned over to their enemies and the people, the people of God would have some terrible consequences to deal with. But they refused to listen. Instead, they continued on day after day in what they were doing and turned their eyes and ears to the false teachers of the day, the false prophets who coddled them in their sin and told them how pleased God was with them and how much blessing God was going to pour out on them because they were God's people. So they turned from conviction and towards whoever would affirm them. And the result of that decision, the consequences, weren't pretty. That's why Lamentations is a book of grieving. But you know, sadly, it's scary to think that Jerusalem's response when confronted with sin sometimes is a lot like we can be today. So I want to ask you, Christians, and I'm talking to you if you are a follower of Jesus, when the Holy Spirit and the Word of God directly collide with your lifestyle, how do you respond? In your decisions, your way of thinking, your relationships, your everyday choices, what is your response? Not just at a conference, but when you get back home and you're in the everyday rhythm of your life. Because Jerusalem decided that they wanted the best of both worlds. They wanted to be God's people, but they also wanted to live however they pleased. They were neither hot nor cold. They were kind of lukewarm. And that's a scary place to be because God says he hates this. And that's strong language. God hates lukewarm, meaning you're kind, of, you're kind of going one direction, you know, this way, but then this part of you is going the other direction. Matthew 6, 24 says you can't serve two masters. You have to choose. And remember, Jeremiah was warning the people of God about this. He was not warning the pagans, even though they were acting like pagans. He was warning God's people and God's people had the right foundation. Remember that picture that we just saw of the foundation? I think you guys saw it. The foundation of the house, that, that you have to have to build a house. They had that. They knew the truth. But they spent years building the wrong stuff, the wrong way on that foundation. And the result was horrible. I mean, how sad. It's like you have everything you need. And then you use all the, the wrong tools, designs, and measurements, and, and material to build a house, and you expect it to work. Like, that would drive my husband insane. And look at these pictures. Okay, y'all, I had a lot of fun Googling this. <laughs> he didn't expect to see that this morning, did you? Listen, look what these people did. Whoever, <laughs> okay, <laughs> whoever did this, I mean, I really hope they didn't get paid. It's like you had one job, you know, like design the bathroom. But instead of fixing it, homeboy sliced or sawed half of an oval that, you know, slices through the toilet. And to be honest, it completely exposes whatever vulnerable soul is using the bathroom. <laughs> but instead of fixing it, he, you know, he was like, eh, that'll do That'll work. And it's like, y'all, th <laughs> this is what it looks like when you try to make your relationship with Jesus work while building the way that the world says and the way that you want to instead of how God says. I mean, I know that's kind of a dumb example, but you, you look at that bathroom and you're like, something clearly does not work, but you're trying to force it to work. Like, it, you know, why, why are you sawing a, a, an oval into your door? It doesn't have to be that way. Next picture. Look at this one. 
next picture. It's the, okay. I mean, just take a second, right? These are real, y'all. People did this. I'm not kidding. I mean, you, you know, it's like, what? So this side, the doors are like, yep, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. In fact, I went to this amazing conference where we had this incredible hope sign. And uh, y'all, it was just incredible. We had this worship. It was amazing. And I, yeah, I had, I had this moment where I gave up some things. I, you know, had this moment with the Lord where I, I, I know I needed to turn from some things and some things were not honoring and glorifying to him, but I got back home and honestly, I just decided that, you know, the stairs, that part of my life, just keep separate. Like it's, it's supposed to be separate. Like it was just too difficult when I got home. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out how to, you know, combine the two and we're just going to keep those things separate. And, you know, and people are like, well, honestly, you kind of have to combine the two or you're going to walk out that door and break your leg, you know, and you're like, nah. It'll be fine. But you see, it just doesn't work to live this way. Your house, your life cannot and will not function this way. In fact, it's dangerous. Not only are we all very confused, but you've got some serious hazards going on. Next picture. Listen, we're not even going to get into the cabinets, okay? That was just for fun. But I hope you see my point with this. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 says to be careful how each one of us builds upon the foundation because it really matters. And 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15, if you can just jot that down, that is a great passage to go home and read and, and, or in, in worship and read whenever is a good time for you. Read on your own time. But it's such a good reminder that it actually really matters. So today I'm asking you, in a way, are you in the camp that Jerusalem was in, that you have the right foundation? You're a follower of Jesus, you know the truth, but lately you've been building the wrong things on that foundation and it's a mess. And so if you haven't, I, I wanna encourage you, I know a lot of you probably already have this weekend and it has been beautiful to see, but I've, if, if, you've, if you're the person right now that has kind of held your situation or whatever that sin is close with tight fists and you have refused to acknowledge it even though you have felt the Holy Spirit convicting you about it this entire weekend or for the third time today. Listen, I have been there. I have sat in the seat and I have known exactly what God was asking me to do and I ignored it. Instead, I got out my saw, I started making my oval into the door because I wanted my situation to work the way that I wanted to. And I was convinced it could. And let me tell you, that was the worst mistake of my life. So listen, whatever area you've turned away from God or ignored his voice, simply turn back to him. If you haven't already, just confess it to him. There is so much power in confession. And turn back to his ways to him, to the right blueprints so your bathroom and your stairs don't look like that. And listen, just like it'll take work to tear down that bathroom and to tear down those stairs and to put them where they're supposed to go, it's going to take work when you guys get home and you have to walk this stuff out. All the things that you're hearing, all the things that the Lord's doing with you, I know in a conference surrounded by each other and the encouragement and the worship, you know, it can fire you up. But just remember, when you get home, it might take some work. And that's okay because you have been given a great helper. You have the help of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not all just dependent upon you. All you need to do is be obedient and the Spirit will strengthen you to do what you have to do. And listen, if you do find yourself in this camp that Jerusalem was in, I just want to say, whenever you do turn back to God, you will not find a disapproving look and a look of shame. No, here is what you will find. The Lord's love for you is steadfast. It never ceases. His mercies for you never come to an end. His mercy for you is new every single morning. Great is his faithfulness. The Lord is your portion, not the world. Therefore, you have hope. And maybe you're not in that camp. Maybe in a way you'd say you're in the camp of Jeremiah, that you have been faithfully walking with the Lord and your life has gotten lonely. Listen, in high school, I started to lose some friendships 
And it was a time in my life where God was drawing me to himself. He was opening my eyes to the things of him. I was falling in love with him and his word. But I began to look and live a lot differently than those around me. And my senior year of high school became the loneliest year of my life. And so I panicked. I started reaching for some sort of control, and I withdrew from God, which led to a form of an eating disorder. And I remember one day I was sitting in my room. I was so miserable, and I was staring at the mirror, and I remember God spoke to me so clearly. He said, are you tired? Are you done yet? Because you have too much to do to continue on this path. And I just want to say to you now, if that is you, are you tired? Are you done yet? Because you have too much to do to continue on this path. Because that was a wake-up call for me. And I knew right then and there that I had a choice. I could either continue on this path and completely self-destruct, or I could choose to trust Jesus and his plan for my life with every gut-wrenching, pain-filled ounce of me. And listen, while I was lonely in my circumstances, Jesus was closer than I had ever known. He is close to the brokenhearted. He says, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. And a year that was meant to destroy me, a year that the enemy wanted to take me out with, ended up becoming the most pivotal year of preparation for all that God was about to launch me into. He used that year to refine me so carefully and so purposefully. He really is working all things for your good and for his glory, all things. So if you're lonely and discouraged and feel like even though you are on a right path, it's been hard, listen, this is what Jesus says, Luke 6, 47 through 49. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. Listen, sometimes you need someone to remind you, or better yet, Jesus' words to remind you that this storm you're in will not take you out because you are building your life on the rock, on a firm and solid foundation on Jesus, and he cannot be shaken. He is faithful, and you are building your house well. You're building it with truth. You're building it with the help and presence and power of the Holy Spirit. You're building it with perseverance. You're building it with obedience. So stay close to him. Stay close. This storm will end. I promise you, this season will end. He is faithful. He will sustain you in it. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Maybe right now you need to remind your soul just like Jeremiah did in the midst of his pain. And that is just pouring your heart out to the Lord. Lord, I, I have been confused. I have been lonely. Lord, I have been just overwhelmed. I have been hurting but Lord, even in all of that, this I will call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Your steadfast love for me never ceases. Whew, it's gonna get me emotional. His mercy for you never comes to an end. Great is his faithfulness. I didn't expect to cry. But his faithfulness, his mercies for you are new every single morning. And the Lord is your portion. Therefore, you have hope. Whew. Listen, and finally, the third camp. You know, after Jesus talks about the wise person who builds their house on the rock, he talks about those who don't. He says in Matthew 7, 26 through 27, but everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. So I wanna ask you, do you know what foundation you're building your life on? Are you on the sand or are you on the rock? Because listen, this is so important. If you are on the sand, then truthfully from what everything that Jesus 
says in his word, you have everything to fear. Because listen, you might have a mansion with your life. It might be beautiful. It might be perfect. It might look perfect. And you have worked hard for that. Or you might say, listen, I'm a good person. I do good things in the world. And that's great that you do. But listen, no matter how much good you do, no matter how beautiful your life is, if you don't have Jesus, you are on the sand. And remember, a house without a foundation will crumble. You have no foundation on the sand. And here's the truth, without Jesus, we are all on the sand, every single one of us. In fact, we start our lives on the sand, headed for destruction, just like that house. And here's why. In the very beginning, when man was first disobedient to God, sin came into the picture. And when sin entered the world, it put all of humanity under a curse. It infected everything. That's why there's brokenness. That's why there's evil. That's why there's pain. And when sin entered into the picture, it separated man from God. Because Adam and Eve, the very first humans, they had relationship with God. They walked with God. It was beautiful. But sin entered and it separated man because God is holy and holiness cannot dwell with sin. And God is a good and righteous judge. And because he is a good judge, sin has to be punished. It can't go unpunished. He's a good judge. A good judge wouldn't let sin go unpunished. And so we have a big problem because we are the sinners. And under that curse, we are supposed to pay for that sin for all of eternity when we die one day. And it doesn't matter how big or small you think your sins are, there's still a gap. We still don't meet the standards of holiness we're still separated from God. The curse owns humanity. But, but there is hope. And that hope changes everything. Because Jesus loves you so much, He made a way to break the curse once and for all and to save us. In other words, he made a way to pick you up out of the sand and set your feet on a solid rock. Out of his great love for you, Jesus left his throne in heaven and came down to earth. God became flesh to die on earth as the perfect sinless sacrifice on the cross, the only thing powerful enough to break the curse. And when he hung on the cross, when Jesus hung on the cross for you and for me, God made an exchange. He put all of our shame, our guilt, our curse, our punishment, all on Jesus. And Jesus took the horrors of hell for us so that you and I don't have to. And on the third day after his death, God raised Jesus up from the death, from from the grave, defeating death, defeating the curse once and for all, that death is no longer to be feared for those who put their faith and their trust in Jesus will be saved. And listen, one day when you stand before God, which is something we are all going to do, At the end of your life, whenever that is, when you stand before God on a day called judgment day, when God looks at you, he will not see the curse. He will not see your sin. Instead, he will see the perfect sacrifice, the perfect atonement of Jesus that covers you. Isaiah 118 says, though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow and you will spend eternity with him in heaven. Your eternity was drastically altered by the cross. And so no matter what happens in this life, No matter what happens in this world, you need not fear the world and you need not fear death. Because on the rock, 
on Jesus, on that firm foundation, this you can always call to mind. And therefore you have hope that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, that his mercies are new every single morning. His mercies never come to an end. Great is his faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, my whole hope is in him. So if today you would say that you, you know that you are on the sand, that you know you need Jesus, and if you feel something drawing you to give your life to Jesus, I just wanna tell you that is the spirit of God drawing you. That is God calling you back to a relationship with him. That is God bringing you from death to life, that he is calling you home. And the great thing is that he has already called you by name. He's already called you to be his daughter. So listen, if that's you, whether you're in this room or you're on the other side of the screen, Admit that you're a sinner. Just admit to God that without Him, you are hopeless. Without Him, you have zero way to get out of this curse. You, you are dead in your sin. So God, I am a sinner. I need you. I have no hope without you. And then believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus died on a cross for your sins, as, your, as the sacrifice to cover you, to atone for you. So God, I believe that you are the son of God, that you died on the cross for me to pay for my sins. And then confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And not just you're saying this or you're saying a prayer, but you are confessing that he is now Lord of your life, Lord of your heart, that you are now his and ask him to come into your heart and that you will follow him the rest of the days of your life until you get home to heaven one day. So listen, if that is you, if that is you, there's gonna be a prayer team in the back and they have um, lanyards that are glowing. You can see them back there. And they are there to pray with you, to walk with you, to answer any questions that you have. Don't hesitate to go to them. And also you have this card under your seat, I think, and it's a response card. And if you are giving your life to Jesus, go ahead and tell us about it. Or if there's an area throughout the conference or now that you are like, I need to get right with God about this, I need to respond, let us know. This will help us know how to walk with you, how to pray with you. Or if you're lonely and discouraged and you're in that second camp we talked about, I just pray tonight that you remind yourself of the truth and that God refreshes you in your spirit. That this storm will end, that you are on a firm and solid foundation. God delights so much over you. So I'm gonna pray and then the worship band is gonna come, come back up and for just the next few minutes, just stay in your seat and maybe just have a time with the Lord to respond to him. And then the worship band will tell you um, will tell you when to stand and tell you when to come forward. God, I just thank you for your truth, God. I thank you that your truth, your hope changes everything. Lord, that it alters absolutely everything. God, I thank you that you are our hope, that without you, we have nothing, God. But I thank you that you didn't leave us there. You didn't leave us hopeless. But God, you loved us so much to save us to set our feet on a foundation, on a rock. Lord, and I thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit to guide us, to help us in this life until we get home to you, until we get to heaven one day, God. And I thank you again for every single one of these girls, Lord. I pray that you would have your way in their hearts and their minds. And God, do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen.